A very, very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, this Saturday morning as we um, come back for this next edition of the SK Dharmalingam Lecture Series. As you know, this is a lecture series on educating medical professionals, health professionals, on uh, various aspects pertaining to cancer. And this month, it uh, of course, is very apt for us to uh, speak about uh, in line with NPC Awareness Month, uh, we, we are going to speak about nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And to, joining us this morning are two eminent uh, physicians uh, and experts. This, this is really quite an exciting uh, session for me, though, because I think this is one of the few times we have multi-specialists uh, coming on on the SK, SKD. Usually we have uh, a single person come on. So today we're very lucky, very fortunate and uh, very exciting for us to have two eminent uh, specialists with us 
who are going to speak about nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Please allow me to first introduce to you all Dr. Hadip Singh Gende. He's a specialist otorhinolaryngologist uh, for the rest of us, ENT. Uh, <laughs> head and neck surgeon, and he's a lecturer and um, specialist with Hospital Chancellor Tuan Kumuris, UKM, HUKM. Uh, good morning, doctor. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, good morning, uh, Dr. Morali. Thanks for the uh, kind introduction. Um, I'm amazed you got the uh, word otorhinolaryngologist correct. Uh, oh, it's a bit of a mouthful day. sometimes. Yeah. Even practice to be, all yeah. day, all day. Yeah. Practice all day, Smalam. Uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and uh, thanks yeah. so much, Doc, for joining us this morning. Uh, a My privilege pleasure. and an honor. Uh, and of course, our second eminent speaker for this morning is Dr. Karia Side. Dr. Kyria is a specialist oncologist, also with Hospital Chancellor Tuanko Mures, HUKM. Uh, good morning, Dr. Kyria. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, Dr. Murali. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, always, always a pleasure and an honor. And really, um, I, I was just saying, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to Dr. Kyria, thank you so much, especially this list last few days before I year, uh, <laughs> in that rare time when nak kerja, beli baju lah and all that. Thank you so much for taking some time off to speak to all of us. So, um, I, I, I as just before kind of we kick, we kick off the session, I want to ask uh, both of y'all on um, how is the kind of um, team at HUKM and how does uh, the ENT surgeon work with the oncologist? How, how, do, how has this dynamic been? How has this mechanism been? Maybe uh, Dr. Hardeep can say a few words first and then Dr. Karia. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Murali. Yeah, cancer treatment, um, as we all know, uh, it's not a one man's show. Uh, it's often a multi-disciplinary team uh, management when it comes to, to managing these patients. Um, when it comes to diagnosing a cancer from an ENT perspective, um, we work closely uh, with uh, our consultants, um, our specialists, and also our medical officers. When, they, when we see a patient with cancer, we will discuss it uh, in a team. Uh, in the ENT uh, fraternity in our hospital, uh, we've got uh, various subspecialties. Uh, we've got uh, the head and neck subspecialty, which is under Professor uh, Dr. Mohamed Razif. And uh, we've got the rhinology subspecialty, which is under Professor Selena. Uh, we've got the laryngology and so on. So um, whenever we've got a case, we will discuss uh, the case with our respective teams and then um, uh, discuss the case uh, in the radio conference. So. Uh, all cancer patients require some form of imaging. Uh, they get imaged uh, and then we'll discuss the scans in terms of staging, what we can do. After that, we will finally bring the patients uh, to the oncology combined meeting. And we've been very much supported by a great oncology team uh, spearheaded by Professor uh, Dr. Fuad and also his team. And we've got Dr. Kyria Sidhe over here. Uh, they've been assisting us uh, in uh, managing um, um, head and neck cancers uh, in our hospital. Right. Thank you, Doc. Dr. Kaira, maybe? Yeah, so basically in our department, uh, we have five in total, including our HOD, head of department, uh, Professor Datuk Dr. Huad Ismail. Uh, I think everybody knows him. And also, um, we have Dr. Marfoa, my staff, Dr. Hilawati, and now we have new uh, uh, oncologist who's doing the segment, Dr. Faiza. So basically, for our side, for, uh, for us, we actually managing all type of cancer, right, from head to toe. But we are starting to focusing on more certain tumor type meaning that certain oncologists would focusing more on certain um, uh, tumor sites. For example, like ENT, myself and Dr. Mahua are doing more the uh, head and neck cancer. So as uh, Dr. Hadi already uh, mentioned, um, treating cancer is never one man show because the cancer itself is very complex disease and the treatment should be personalized and tailored according to the patient's um, condition because there's a lot of things to take into account, especially patients factor, the disease factors, the treatment factors inside that. So yeah. Right. Thank you so much, Doctor. It's, it's really very interesting to actually um, kind of realize that uh, more and more like the oncologists themselves are starting to subspecialize into certain particular types of cancers. And that actually makes quite a difference in terms of treatment, doesn't it, Doctor? Exactly. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, please allow me to, to turn the session over 
to Dr. Hadib first, and then subsequently we'll take some questions if and when you do have them. And the second part of the session will be by Dr. Karia. So Dr. Hadib will cover with us today a little bit about um, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, give us an overall picture, and you know, speak about the kind of um, uh, aspects of how to stage the disease, what are we looking at to investigate. Subsequently, Dr. Karia is going to come in to speak to us about how to treat uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And together, uh, I think we'll get a much more holistic picture and updated picture, more importantly, uh, about how we actually manage the disease. So without further ado, please allow me to turn the session over to Dr. Hadib. Over to you, Doctor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Morelli. Okay, let me just uh, share my screen. Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen and fellow colleagues, um, Salam Suryatra and, and good morning once again. Um, I'll be, my name is Hardip and uh, Hardip Jende from the uh, Department of Otorhinolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, uh, based at the Faculty of Medicine um, at the uh, Hospital Chancellor Tuanku Muhis uh, under the uh, University of Bangsa and Malaysia Medical Center. So um, as we all know, we'll, uh, I'll be speaking to you about nasal pharyngeal carcinoma, uh, a, a brief overview on nasal pharyngeal carcinoma. I'll be speaking to you about the background of NPC, uh, its causes, uh, it's um, epidemiology, uh, how do patients with NPC present, uh, how can we diagnose them, uh, and how can we stage them, and also what screening options uh, do we have for these uh, patients. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before we dwell into uh, NPC, uh, it's first important uh, to understand um, the, a little bit about the anatomy of the uh, nasopharynx. Over here, I've got a coronal view of the uh, patient's skull. As you can see, the nose, uh, and you can see the uh, nasopharynx is the area which is posterior uh, to the nose, which connects uh, the nose to the oropharynx here. Yeah? And um, the, the boundaries of the nasopharynx, as you can see, above or superiorly is the sphenoid, uh, which is the basic sphenoid. At the back or posteriorly, we have the prevertebral muscles and also fascia, especially the first two cervical vertebra. Uh, on the floor, um, the floor of the nasopharynx uh, um, anteriorly is formed by the soft palate and posteriorly is deficient. It connects uh, to the oropharynx inferiorly. On its lateral borders, we've got the opening of the eustachian tube and anteriorly, we've got the nasal cavity, yeah? Uh, the nasal cavity opens up into the nasal pharynx via the posterior nasal opening, which is called the nasal coena. So this is an axial view um, of the nasal pharynx. If you look on your left-hand side, um, you can appreciate that the nasal pharynx is uh, quite close by to uh, important structures within the neck, namely the carotid sheath, uh, with, which houses our carotid arteries. Um, and uh, anteriorly, we've got the neck, I mean, uh, we've got the nose again. And of course, laterally, we've got the eustachian tube opening. And the eustachian tube opening is just very close uh, to the uh, fossa resumula. Now, the fossa resumula is actually a outpouching uh, and a fold of mucosa laterally on both sides, the left and also right hand side um, of the nasopharynx. Uh, and because it, it's a fold of mucosa, so quite often, uh, tumors from the nasopharynx get missed if they're very, very small. Uh, and this is the most commonest area in which uh, tumors of the nasopharynx may originate from. Now, do not get fooled. Occasionally, we do have some tumors of the nasopharynx that may come uh, from superiorly from the uh, skull base extending uh, inferiorly. But the fossa resumella uh, is the most common area within the nasopharynx which tumors of the nasopharynx uh, may um, originate from. If you look at the image, the nasal endoscopy image on the uh, right hand side, on your right hand side, uh, this is a nasal endoscopy image of a uh, right nasal cavity. Um, and you can see the ET, which stands for the eustachian tube, which is in very close proximity uh, to the uh, nasal pharynx. IT uh, represents the inferior turbinate um, of the nose. Uh, and you have the nasal septum uh, on your right hand side. Uh, this whole opening, which you can see, uh, is the posterior coena which looks into the patient's uh, nasopharynx. So what is NPC? So basically, NPC arises from the uh, nasopharyngeal epithelium. Yeah? And uh, 
evidence show that Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, is involved in its formation. Uh, it's involved in the malignant transformation of epithelial cells. And uh, when, it when it comes to ethnicity, it's more common among the Asian ethnicity. Uh, and this is more common among Orientals. And among the Orientals, it's more common among those in southern China. And that's why some people also call it the Cantonese cancer. And uh, given, given that we've got a lot of Oriental people in the Southeast Asian uh, communities, therefore, uh, it's also very common uh, in the Southeast Asian community and also the Northern African uh, descents also. Um, this is also common in some populations of the Middle East. And the male to female ratio in the world is about two to one. Uh, and NPC often has a bimodal distribution. Therefore, it's got two peaks, yeah? Uh, one peak uh, among the younger generation occurs in adolescence, and the more common second peak often occurs at age that ranges between 50 to uh, 60 years. What causes NPC? Now, the three main fundamental causes of NPC, um, it's multifactorial for sure, and we can further classify into genetic causes, uh, viral causes that we spoke about, EBV, and also environmental causes, like every other cancer. Now, when we go into genetics, uh, as we all know, the Southern Chinese um, uh, population um, are highest at risk of getting NPC. And studies have shown that when the Southern Chinese population migrate to other areas, for example, to Malaysia, to America, NPC is still higher in these populations after, even after migration. But uh, the, um, the uh, propensity reduces um, uh, in this second and so third generation uh, of, 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 of population. It's also common among patients who have uh, first degree relatives uh, with uh, NPC. And uh, a lot of studies being done and uh, there are five or six genes that have been found nowadays uh, that may be as, uh, associated with uh, NPC. I wouldn't dwell too much in this genetic factors um, as there's still ongoing studies uh, to further identify these genes. Now, viral causes. Uh, latest evidence have showed that Epstein-Barr virus um, uh, is associated with NPC. And we all know that uh, in testing of Epstein-Barr virus, we can either do a viral capsule antigen. Uh, it's got low specificity, but high sensitivity. We can also test for early antigens, which has got high specificity, but low uh, sensitivity. It's often used in combination. Latest studies have also shown that human papilloma virus may have a role um, but this is yet uh, to be established. Environmental uh, causes, as you know, pollution, uh, smoking, like every other cancer, smoking uh, is a culprit. And uh, there's very strong evidence to show that salted fish contains nitrosamines, and this may contribute uh, to uh, N NPC, incense, and also wood burning. Um, it's a saying that among the uh, Chinese population, uh, the use of joysticks. Uh, 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 may sometimes contribute uh, to NPC, um, but you know um, it's a saying. But uh, how how true is that? We yet you know, we, we still do not know. And um, occupational hazards um, such as wood dust um, over a prolonged period uh, may also contribute to nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Not only nasopharyngeal carcinomas, but other cancers of the nose, um, such as adenocarcinomas of the nose. Now, what's, what's the Malaysian um, epidemiology like? Uh, when, it, when it comes to Malaysian population, it's still highest among the uh, Chinese ethnicity. In Malaysia, uh, the Chinese ethnicity contribute to almost 50% uh, of, of NPC. Uh, this is then followed by, by our brothers and sisters in uh, Borneo, in Sabah and Sarawak, that contribute to 28%. And also the Malay population, which is about 22%, and this is followed by the uh, Indian population or ethnicity, which is uh, the lowest. Within uh, Borneo itself, the Bidayo uh, uh, ethnicity predominates uh, at about 50% in Sarawak itself. Now, NPC is the first, is a, sorry, it's the fourth most common cancer among Malaysians in general, uh, and the third most common among Malaysian men. Yeah. And um, more than 70% of these cases in Malaysia present as late stage disease. So this is what I want to highlight. Um, this is because you know, NPC is a very non-specific symptoms uh, and it's very difficult to examine the nasopharynx. I mean, we're all limited uh, to examine the nasopharynx. Even as an ENT surgeon, I can't visualize the, the nasopharynx without my nasal endoscope. 
So I need my nasal endoscopy to, to visualize the nasal pharynx. And in Malaysia, unlike, unlike the rest of the world, the rest of the world, the male to female ratio is two to one. In Malaysia, the male to female ratio is uh, three to one. Why is more males? Hard to say. Is it because of smoking? Possible. Now, how does the uh, NPC uh, spread? As we all know, the nose, especially the nasal pharynx, sits in the center of what we know is the brain. It sits in the center of, you know, just next to our eyes. Uh, it sits behind uh, our, our nasal passage. Uh, it sits just above our oral cavity. And uh, it's, it's within the, air, the center area of the head and neck. So it can easily spread, especially to areas of the eyes and also to the brain. Now, it can spread to the skull base via the foramen lastrum and also the foramen ovale uh, and cause um, eye symptoms uh, such as screen nerves 3, 4, 5, and so 6 palsies. Uh, when you affect screen nerve 5, we can also have facial pain or facial numbness in these patients. As we mentioned earlier on, the eustachian tube lies lateral uh, to the uh, nasopharynx, and it can easily spread into the opening um, of the eustachian tube within the nose and cause it to have you know, ear problems, or ear issues such as otitis media or middle ear effusions. It can also spread anteriorly uh, to the nose uh, and cause nasal symptoms such as blood from the nose or epistaxis. It can spread just laterally to the orbit via the lamina propitia. Now, the eye is separated from the nose via a very thin bone, which is called the lamina propitia. And, and this thin bone can be very easily eroded uh, by tumors. And, and, some, and when, it, when the tumors goes into the orbit, uh, they can have double vision. Uh, it, it may push the globe outwards, cause proptosis. Um, it can invade into the nasal lacrimal drug, a duct, that's for, therefore the patient may have epiphora or you know, frequent watering of the eyes. Yeah. And it can also um, go to the cervical nodes. Uh, so it drains to the um, upper jugular nodes first before it goes to the lower jugular nodes and also to the posterior uh, triangle nodes, the level five lip nodes, the occipital lip nodes. So patients may also present with lipidinopathy um, of the uh, cervical nodes and also the occipital nodes. And, cause, uh, and this may cause lip node enlargements. Um, in, in very advanced disease, it may cause distant metastasis. Uh, common areas of metastasis would be the lung, the liver, and also the patient's uh, bones. Not to forget, um, the retropharyngeal nodes are just behind or just posterior to the nasopharynx. Uh, that's often um, the first node that gets drained to before it goes to the um, upper jugglers. So some, in these patients with a very large retropharyngeal nodes, they may have a neck pain and also stiffness. It can go laterally from the nose, infralaterally into the parapharyngeal spaces. Um, as we all know, in the parapharyngeal space, um, we've got a carotid sheath. Um, it can um, uh, affect the sympathetic nerves within, within the carotid sheath and result in a Horner syndrome. And um, if it goes more laterally into the infratemporal fossa, it can also affect the uh, pterygoid muscles. And these patients may present with trismus, but this is a very advanced uh, case. Now, how does patients with NPC present? First, the most common presentations of patients with NPC is the neck presentation. And, and among the neck presentation, majority of them will present with a neck lump or a neck mess. And this lumps are often painless. Non-infective lesions are often painless in head and neck. Infective lesions are often painful. Yeah? And this can be either bilateral or either unilateral. Yeah? Because the NPC uh, uh, origins from the nasopharynx, and the nasopharynx is a common cavity. It may drain into the left cervical lip nodes, or it may drain into the right cervical lip nodes. If you appreciate the image on the top right-hand corner, um, this is a patient we had a couple of years ago. Um, she developed NPC while she was pregnant, and she decided for, uh, to, 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 to withhold treatment um, as she wanted her pregnancy to go through. Uh, sadly, uh, the mom sacrificed for the baby. The baby survived. and and eventually she succumbed to a disease. She presents with, with severe bilateral disease. And she, as you can appreciate it, you know, there's a large lipidinopathy of uh, her jugular nodes uh, and also cervical nodes on the right and also left side. If you compare that to the image on the right-hand side below, uh, this is a gentleman who presents with a level two lip node, um, you know, which is about three by two centimeters. This is just one lip node. Uh, and another gentleman on the lower image on the left-hand side He's got a bigger lip node uh, just below uh, his right uh, yellow. Very rarely would these patients have any skin changes. Um, only in advanced disease, 
um, where there's metastasis, metastasis or involvements of the skin, that they'll have ulceration of the skin. But on initial presentation, they'll, they'll often present with neck nodes, which can be bilateral or unilateral, very rarely involving the skin. Um, these nodes can either be mobile or they can be attached to underlying structures uh, or to other lymph nodes. Now, the second most common presentation would be the nose. Um, as we all know, NPC sits behind the nasal cavity. So these patients, these tumors are sometimes highly vascularized. So this, uh, it may bleed uh, and may become dry, may be crusting in these tumors. And sometimes these patients may present with epistaxis or uh, a unilateral uh, nasal bleeding. Uh, in a large tumor, the bleeding may be bilateral, uh, not, not only unilateral, may be bilateral. And because tumor obstructs uh, sinus drainage uh, uh, within the nose, uh, therefore there can be collections of uh, secretions within the nose. There may be crusting um, within the nose. We can have secondary bacterial infection. And sometimes these patients may also complain of cacosmia. As the NPC grows, it becomes larger. It may obstruct the whole of the nasal pharynx, or it may go anteriorly, uh, as we saw earlier on, into the uh, nasal cavity. And this may result in either unilateral nasal blockage or, bi or eventually bilateral uh, nasal blockage. And these patients are often mouth breathers. Now, NPC may also affect the eustachian tube. So it's not shocking for patients to present with just ear symptoms. As we have seen, the tumor can grow laterally and also obstruct the eustachian tube. So it's common for NPC patients to present with ear symptoms or ear infections. If you look at the image on the far right-hand corner, um, this is a classical image of middle ear effusion. Uh, this is because fluid from the middle ear is unable to drain uh, into the nasal cavity via the eustachian tube. If you look at the far right-hand corner, the second image below, um, that's um, a patient with a very retracted uh, tibetic membrane. This is again, Eustachian tube block, uh, blockage uh, will prevent ventilation of the middle ear, and therefore the patient will develop uh, middle ear effusion with retraction um, of the uh, tibetic membrane and also accumulation of some fluid within the tibetic membrane. If you look at the image on the left upper, uh, uh, upper corner, um, that's a bulging tympanic membrane. Uh, this is classical um, of otitis media. They may develop secondary bacterial infections due to poor ventilation um, of this ear. This, this sympathetic membrane will eventually rupture and, uh, and, and result in pus or discharge from the ear or rather authoria. As you can see below, uh, you know, there's a um, ruptured tympanic membrane uh, with a lot of infection or rather granulation tissue, uh, which can be seen um, in the uh, middle ear. Around the tympanic membrane, there's a residual uh, tympanic membrane, uh, which can be seen. And, and this, this is kind of what we call a central perforation uh, in such patients. Whenever they get ear infections, they may complain of fullness in the ear or ear blockage because of secretions or pus within the ear. And uh, obviously, uh, they'll then complain of loss of hearing. Uh, and whenever there's infections, uh, there may also be tinnitus, which is a ringing sound in the ear, and of course, pain or rather otalgia. Now, NPC usually starts from one nasopharynx to the left or the right. Uh, so often, um, ear symptoms may be unilateral but sometimes it may progress to a bilateral disease uh, as the NPC gets bigger and crosses over to the contralateral side. So do not be shocked that the patients may be coming to you with just an ear symptom. And therefore, I always tell my uh, ENT uh, trainees that whenever a patient comes with ear symptoms, we always have to check the nose because the ear is always associated with the nose. Always put a scope into the nose and have a look at the eustachian tube opening. Uh, you know, something as simple as um, you know, allergic rhinitis or chronic rhinitis sinusitis can cause ear symptoms. And if we do not treat the nose, we're not going to, you know, uh, treat the ear. Now, as we mentioned early on, uh, the nasopharynx lies behind and also in between both of our eyes. And therefore, um, it's not shocking that uh, about 10 to 15 percent of uh, NPC may present as an ophthalmo neuro neurologic symptoms. Yeah. So it may go superior to the skull base and result in headaches. Uh, it, may, it may involve the trigeminal nerve, therefore the patient may present with facial numbness. And um, if it involves the eyes, uh, the middle rectus muscle, they may present with diplopia, a double vision. And it involves the, um, the neck uh, and it may cause uh, Horner syndrome, Horner syndrome, 
and because inferiorly the patient may have Christmas and you know uh, if it affects the lower cranial nerves the patient you also have dysphagia and also hospice and um, uh, sometimes global cranial nerves such as the nerve 10 uh, which supplies the laryngeal nerves the vagus nerve which supplies the laryngeal nerves may result in hoarseness now um, this is the golden question we want to ask ourselves how do we diagnose um, npc i understand that we have a lot of primary care physicians uh, general practitioners with us today um, and what you can do uh, in your center is uh, perform a good uh, physical examination of the head and neck you may perform a neck palpation to have a feel of all uh, the different quadrants of the neck just to, to look for any lymphadenopathy or enlarged lymph nodes in this area. You may perform an otoscopy to see if the patients may have a discharging ear or an ear infection. Um, you may perform an oral examination to look for any trismus um, or any tumors which can be seen um, extending inferiorly um, from the nasopharynx. Very rare, but you know sometimes we see that. And uh, you may also perform a clean nerve examination. Um, if the patient has um, um, clean nerve deficits, um, then it may suggest that the tumor has probably gone to the skull base. And therefore, it's an advanced tumor. So when I, when I perform uh, a neck examination of my patients in clinic, um, I often stand behind them. I palpate, you know, in ENT, we call this the level ones, level two, level three, four, five, and also the occipital um, lip nodes. Um, that gives me a good um, uh, coverage on how to palpate uh, the lip nodes. And when you suspect something is not right, then you will then, um, the best thing is to uh, then uh, refer them to an ENT surgeon. Now, that's where me as an ENT, uh, we come in. What I can do extra is I can perform a nasal endoscopy and have a look inside uh, the patient's nasal cavity. If I find a tumor uh, in the nasal pharynx or the patient's nasal cavity, um, I can then biopsy uh, these patients. Now, most nasopharyngeal carcinoma tumors within the nasopharynx can be biopsied uh, under local anesthesia. Uh, these are tumors that are not very vascularized. They are vascularized, but not very vascularized. Um, I can just have to decongest the nose. Um, I can just biopsy them in clinic. However, in certain patients um, who have um, cardiac problems, or patients who are on uh, blood thinners, or if the patient looks very, uh, if tumor looks very, very vascularized, um, I wouldn't want to biopsy them under local anesthesia and clinic. Um, I would uh, biopsy them in a safe environment uh, in the operation theater where uh, it's a safe environment. I can control bleeding. I can diatomize the tumor in case um, there's significant bleeding. But in general, most uh, NPC tumors can be biopsied safely uh, in the clinic. So this is a picture of a nasal endoscopy um, of, a, of the right nasal cavity. As you can appreciate, over here, I'll just pause this image. Just give me one second. So, so I'm at the posture core now. I'm looking into the nasal cavity, upwards into the nasal pharynx right now. Um, this fold over here is called the, um, uh, the fossa resumula. As we can appreciate, um, there's a fungating uh, tumor which is arising um, from the fossa resumula, a lateral part of the nasal pharynx extending uh, medially uh, to, to the uh, center um, of the nasal pharynx. You may also appreciate, sorry, this image is not, there's a lot of glare on this image. You may also appreciate that there's some crusting uh, in, the, in this tumor, and uh, this tumor is not very vascularized, it's very irregular, so therefore I would proceed to biopsy this patient in clinic. A lot of patients with um, NPCs may also have other nasal symptoms. If you look at this patient, there's uh, also pus arising from the maxillosinus um, opening, the maxillosinus ostium, uh, so this patient also has uh, acute renal sinusitis, which needs to be treated. Again, this is a second nasal endoscopy picture of another patient. Now, this patient's a bit different. Uh, this is a, a you know looks looks like you know uh, adenoids arising from the center of the uh, nasal cavity, but um, this turned out to be NPC. And this NPC is a bit different in this patient. I'll just replay it back again. In this, in this patient, the tumor is arising from the roof of the nasopharynx, in the center of the nasopharynx, um, going inferiorly. Sorry. Okay. Some patients may only present with a neck lesion, yeah, with a neck uh, swelling or neck mass. And this is, can be a metastasis from the NPC. Um, what uh, we can do to confirm is we can perform a, a fine needle aspiration or cytology for this patient. We don't have to perform an excision biopsy. An FNAC is usually sufficient to tell us whether 
uh, this tumor is a metastatic disease? Is it a metastatic MTC or, or is it some form of a lymphoma um, or is it a uh, or other uh, uh, primary cancers of the lymph nodes? Now, what are the differential diagnoses of, of, of a tumor from the nasopharynx besides being MTC? Common tumors from the nasopharynx can be sarcomas, can be lymphomas. Lymphomas more common than sarcomas. Uh, and other benign tumors um, of the nasopharynx can be uh, pleomorphic adenoma, which are, which are minor, minor slurry gland tumors. And in this image below, you can appreciate that the physician is performing a fine needle aspiration of the patient. Um, it can be performed um, as an outpatient. The patient does not need to be admitted. And we do not need to perform an excision biopsy uh, in these patients. A fine needle aspiration often will suffice. Very rarely, I have to perform an excision biopsy. The only times I'll perform an excision biopsy if the fine needle aspiration in cytology is inconclusive or has yield, yielded insufficient sample. Or if it's a lymphoma, then uh, the uh, hematologist will then ask me to perform uh, an, an excisional incisional biopsy of the lymph node to confirm what subtype of lymphoma or Hodgkin's or non Hodgkin's. Otherwise, very rarely we need to perform an excision biopsy. Now, once um, we've, we've done the biopsy, we've confirmed NPC, what else can we do is we will do uh, uh, to stage the patient. And the way we can stage the patient is to perform imaging. Now, the best imaging modality uh, for the head and neck uh, in NPC would be uh, magnetic resonance imaging, a contrasted study with gadolinium, of course. Uh, and uh, this is because MRI gives us very good soft tissue uh, delineation. Now, the image on your right-hand side uh, is a T1 uh, non-contrasted image uh, on the MRI. Uh, as you can see that um, there's a soft tissue uh, or high, hyper intensity, uh, which is, can be seen within the nasopharynx, extending to the uh, eustachian tube and also extending superiorly uh, to the temporal lobes um, uh, of the patient's uh, brain and also anteriorly involving the um, orbital apex. Um, MRI is good because, as I mentioned earlier, it gives us very good soft tissue uh, delineation. Um, it's also very good to see if there's any involvement of the orbit. Uh, it's also good to see if there's any involvement of the uh, intracranial region of the skull base um, and also the uh, prevertebral muscles posteriorly. Um, however, we understand that, especially in public hospitals, um, MRI is difficult uh, to get to. Sometimes the waiting list is long. So many of us are. Uh, are happy uh, by, by just doing uh, a CT scan uh, of the uh, head and neck, which is often adequate. Uh, in a CT scan of head and neck, we can also appreciate uh, soft tissue density, which is uh, highlighted by this uh, yellow um, outline uh, within, the nasal cavity, within the nasal cavity. In this patient, uh, it's more heavier, the disease is more heavier towards the right-hand side, it spreads to the middle and then across to the uh, left-hand side. Um, there's also an asterisk over there, uh, not to forget these patients have also got the right uh, maxillary sinusitis um, over them. Uh, the CT scan is also able to tell us if there's any neck metastasis and in these patients. Quite often, we'll request for a CT scan of the head and neck, uh, thorax, uh, and also abdomen um, uh, to see if, uh, as part of staging to see if there's any distant metastasis. However, in centers where uh, it's difficult to get a CT scan uh, or smaller centers where uh, you know this, the waiting list of the CT scan is too long, then a CT scan of the head and neck and also upper thorax will suffice. We can then do a chest x-ray on ultrasound of the patient's abdomen to complete the staging. Now, there's also um, a, uh, an, a, a, a chance for us to do a PET scan. Uh, a PET scan is preferred uh, for patients with recurrent NPC, uh, for patients with residual NPC. Residual disease are diseases that after treatment, uh, they still uh, fail to disappear, yeah? In recurrent treatment is, uh, in recurrent diseases are diseases where we've treated them, um, um, they've, they've gone to remission, they, they've, they've, they've gone away, but then, then they reappear again um, after a certain time limit or a certain time span. So CT, I mean, uh, PET scan is good for recurrent disease or restful disease, um, especially in metastasis uh, in patients. And uh, especially in the Klang Valley and also bigger cities like uh, Penang uh, and also Johor, um, Johor Bahru uh, PET scan is readily available uh, in our hospital in uh, in University of Kumasi Malaysia uh, University of Kumasi Malaysia Medical Centre. Uh, we've got uh, uh, PET facilities also. Now, when we speak about diagnosis of NPC, uh, what we're worried about is the delay in diagnosis. Now, this is a good paper uh, in the early two thousands uh, by our, our late Professor Prasad, um, who is one of the seniors and ENT from the University of Malaya. 
And in his paper, uh, he found that neck swelling is, is, is the main presentation of patients uh, with NPC in Malaysia. The second main presentation is nasal symptoms, which can be your epistaxis and nasal blockage. And the third most common is your ear symptoms and a small percentage, about 10%, may present with intracranial extension. These patients may present with headaches, uh, with clear nerve involvements. Now, what is shocking is that uh, the time taken for a patient to consult a doctor is about two to three days whenever they, whenever they have one of these symptoms. But the doctors, including myself, you know, general practitioners, including myself, you know, uh, as an ENT, confirming an NPC, it takes us about, uh, you know, four months to confirm an NPC, about 120 days. So there's a significant delay over here. And uh, patients presenting with neck swelling, it takes them about 94 days for a diagnosis. And patients presenting with ear symptoms often being missed for an NPC it takes about 266 days. What, what can we learn from here is that whenever we have patients presenting with ear symptoms, uh, you treat, treat them for an infection, but if it doesn't resolve, you treat them uh, with second line antibiotics, still doesn't resolve, then you've got to be suspecting something is not right. So you've got to refer them to an ENT and we've got to examine the nose also to make sure that the cause is not from the nose. Similarly, when you have a patient presenting with a neck swelling, with a neck, neck lipidinopathy, you may treat them uh, for, an, for an infective lipidinitis at first. But after giving them a first course of uh, treatment with anti antibiotics, or, uh, it doesn't resolve, you know, it doesn't resolve after two weeks, then, you know, you've got to be suspecting something more sinister. Then perhaps a referral is indicated in these uh, cases whereby an FNAC is probably indicated. What's the weakness of this study is that um, it was mainly based on uh, laborers, uh, uh, those without formal education, and those in rural areas. So it may explain the, the, the late presentation. So the golden question over here, or the, rather the elephant in the room, will be when to refer. Now, um, if you look at the NPC guidelines uh, in Malaysia, it stated that majority of NPC patients, up to 80% NPC patients, present at, at one stage, stages three and four. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Kavya uh, will be speaking after this, will agree to this one. And um, why? They, they found out that patients present late. This is because of lack of awareness um, among both, not only among medical um, professionals like ourselves, but also among the patients of the science of NPC. So patient education is also very important over here. Again, when you have a persistent neck swelling, which has not responded to treatment, you might want to consider referring them because there might be something more sinister. If you have persistent ear infections, you've given them antibiotics, you've given them ear drops, you know, otitis media is still not resolving. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to look into the nose. You've got to refer them to an ENT surgeon. You can put the scope into the nose and make sure there's no nasal disease which is causing the ear symptoms. Yeah? And you have persistent you know, nasal symptoms. You know, patients come to the doctor, you know, I've got unilateral block blockage. You know, uh, you've treated them for rhinitis, you've given them uh, nasal corticosteroids, you give them antihistamine, you know, but their nasal symptoms are not improving, it's getting worsened. Uh, perhaps it's time to refer them uh, so that we can put a scope into the nose again, have a look if there's any uh, obstruction to the nose. Of course, also look out for cranial nerve involvements. Um, other red flag symptoms are especially these patients who have family history of NPCs. If their father had NPCs or died of NPC, uh, their brothers or sisters or uncles had NPC, you know. Uh, and um, I'll be more wary of my uh, Chinese and also uh, Malay patients because uh, it's more common among the Chinese uh, uh, population in Malaysia. Now, how do we stage an NPC? Now, staging can be done via clinical examination, via you know, imaging, as we've discussed, uh, and also via histopathology examination. Now, staging is based on the WHO classification in 2005, whereby it can be divided into creatinizing carcinoma and also non-creatinizing carcinoma. In Malaysia, the non-creatinizing carcinoma is most common. Uh, sorry, when it comes to non-creatinizing carcinoma, uh, it's the undifferentiated carcinoma, which is about 63%, which is most common uh, in Malaysia. And of course, we use the American Joint Committee on Cancer Staging. Um, as we can see, T0 means that the tumor cannot be identified. Um, and um, okay, sometimes we may not be able to find a tumor in the nasal pharynx, but if the FNEC reveals it's an EBV positive or EBA positive, then we will we'll treat them um, as an NPC. Yeah? If there's no tumors in the nasal pharynx, and there's no other causes, and there's no other primary tumors which can be found in head and neck, but the uh, lip node is positive for EBV, then we will treat them for NPC. Um, and T1 is the tumors very limited to the nasal pharynx or the oropharynx uh, and, the, and the nasal cavity. In T2, uh, the tumors have gone to the parapharyngeal space uh, and also other soft tissue involvement. 
In T3, it involves bony structures such as skull base, the vertebra. And in T4, uh, is whenever there's intracranial uh, involvement. Yeah? And we look at uh, N disease, it's very simple. N1 means there's unilateral metastasis in one cervical lymph nodes. That means either the right or the left, which is smaller than six centimeter. N2 means there's both neck involvement, uh, which is smaller than six centimeter. And N3 is any lymph node, which is big, bigger than six centimeter. So it doesn't matter if it's left or right or bilateral, if it's larger than six centimeters, it's N3. And M1 refers to there's positive distant metastases. Now, I just wanna highlight a few things on the staging. If you, if you look at, um, at the staging, um, any T1 tumors is a stage one, you know, T2 tumors is a stage two, T3 is stage three, and also T4 is a stage four, if you look at the green highlights. But if you look at the neck disease, the moment it's, uh, there is a positive lymph node, if it's an N1, it's, it's already at stage two. And if it's an N2, it goes to a stage three. And if, it, if it's an N3, which is more than six centimeters uh, lymph node, automatically it goes to a stage 4A, at one stage 4A. And if you appreciate the moment you have any metastasis to any part of the body apart from the neck, uh, it goes to a stage 4B. And in, in most cases, uh, Dr. Carrier will be speaking after this about treatment of NPC. In most cases, we have a, where, where you have an M1 disease, in most cases, often it is inoperable uh, or you know, um, there's no purpose to operating because it's, it's, there's metastatic disease and these patients often go down the palliative pathway. Now, what screening charts are available to us? And uh, we can either do an EBV serology or we can per perform fiber optic uh, nasopharyngoscopy by, by the ENT. Now, a little bit about EBV uh, serology, as we all know, EBV uh, comes under the herpes virus family and it spreads via saliva. Uh, and it can be dominant for a couple of years and then get activated. Um, and there are a few EBV antibodies out there. We spoke about a viral capsid antigen, BCA. Um, and uh, we spoke about uh, nuclear antigen and IgG to the nuclear antigen. And these are, uh, you know, and, and HPV is quite often responsible for Burkitt's lymphoma uh, and also a NPC. Now, the Ministry of Health has done an assessment on NPC screening, and this is published in 2011. It's a systemic review. It's based on a randomized controlled trial. And uh, they looked at 23 full articles. Uh, there were four cohort studies, five case control studies, uh, 13 cross-sectionals, and also one systemic uh, review. And they found that in terms of NPC screening program, how effective it is, they found that um, the screening of asymptomatic family members uh, annually leads to earlier detection of NPC. So in, in, if that family, the father has got NPC, uh, it's, it's worthwhile to, to, to scope these patients on a yearly basis, yeah? Um, because you know, the risk is higher in these patients. And, um, and the number of affected family members uh, on, the, on the risk of NPC is rather inconclusive. So basically, if you have one member which is affected, then it's good enough uh, and it warrants for screening. And um, how accurate is that? Um, they, they found that um, um, you know, ELISA has better sensitivity and also specificity uh, and has an acceptable diagnostic accuracy and um, cost effectiveness for, for, the, for the nationwide screening program. There's no, uh, there's no evidence for cost effectiveness uh, in this screening program. And um, what are recommendations that there's no evidence uh, on the effectiveness of NPC screening in terms of reduction in mortality uh, and also adjusted life years of survival. So therefore, uh, in Malaysia, they do not recommend a population-based NPC screening program as a public health policy. But uh, it shows that there is some evidence uh, to some fair evidence uh, in diagnosed accuracy of EBV serology tests in NPC screening program, um, but they recommend for further guidelines to be developed uh, in uh, screening for uh, NPC by the use of EBV uh, serology. So I'm coming towards the end uh, of my lecture. Um, how, what can be sum summarized is that NPC is very common among the uh, Chinese ethnicity in Malaysia. Uh, beware of late presentations. Why late presentations happen? This is because of non-specific symptoms. An early referral of these non-specific symptoms to an ENT is important, which allows for an early diagnosis and also for administrating definitive treatment. All right, this is my references, and uh, uh, thank you very much. If you've got any questions uh, with regards to NPC, um, uh, this is my email. You know, feel free to email me. Um, I'm based at the University of Kamaksa in Malaysia at the Faculty of Medicine. Thank you very much. Doc, thank you so much. I think that was a very uh, 
like holistic and I think really a uh, very comprehensive uh, presentation of, about everything we need to know. A couple of questions, uh, Doc, shall we, shall we take them before we get Dr. Karia on? Sure. Okay, lovely. Um, uh, Doc, there's, a, there's a one question on. Um, now, if we do screen for EBV, um, there's different um, labs offering different kind of EBV tests. What is a, a kind of um, more accurate EBV uh, test that we should test for? And um, I, I think uh, kind of along those lines, where if you do get an EBV kind of uh, positive response, what do we then subsequently do with this, with this person? Okay, uh, that's a very good question. Um, now, the Malaysian guidelines say there is, there is a role of um, yeah, EBV uh, testing, but, but you know, um, there's still a lot of studies that are being done to further um, understand to what extent um, EBV can help us uh, in the diagnosis of the NPC. Um, the, the downsides about um, EBV testing um, is that EBV testing, like other tumor markers, um, uh, can be present in, is present in 70-80% of the Asian population, number one. Number two, it cannot be used, uh, it's not effective uh, in identifying um, disease progression and also response to treatment and also recurrence of disease. So that's a downside about EBV testing. Uh, all, all it tells us that the patients with EBV may have a higher susceptibility of getting uh, MPC. And, um, and latest and studies have shown that the, the two most uh, reliable uh, EBV testing, um, I would say, is uh, early antigen uh, and also viral capsid antigen. But having said that, the viral capsid antigen, VCA, has got a high sensitivity but low specificity. The early antigen, it's, uh, on the other hand, has a low uh, specificity but a high sensitivity. So a lot of literature, a lot of uh, um, uh, healthcare professionals have uh, advised combining both one capsid antigen and also early antigen. But this is, uh, but this is not uh, regularly done in Malaysia uh, because it's still, it's still a great area. You know, it just tells us that you're, you're at a high risk of developing NPC and that's about it. Um, in Singapore, they advocate uh, the testing of uh, EBV, uh, um, you know, viral capsid antigen and also early antigen. Um, but in Malaysia, we, we, still don't, we, just, we still don't carry it out yet. Um, what I can, um, uh, you know, um, advise is when you have a patient, uh, especially who is of a uh, uh, Chinese ethnicity, uh, patients with a positive family history of NPC, the, you know, the parents had NPC or the siblings had NPC, um, and these patients present to you with any ENT symptoms such as persistent neck swelling or, you know, nasal blockage or epistaxis or even non-resolving uh, ear discharge or ear symptoms. Um, and these are the patients that uh, you've got to be referring to an ENT uh, for a nasal endoscopy. Because eventually, even though the EBV uh, is, is raised in these patients, you still have to refer them to us. We still have to perform a nasal endoscopy to see if there's any mess uh, in the nasal pharynx. If there's, a mess in the, in the, uh, if there's a mess in the nasal pharynx, I will biopsy it. So EBV actually doesn't tell us much. It tells us the at-risk group, but it doesn't tell us much. You know, we still have to, uh, this patient still needs to be seen by the ENT. The ENT still needs to scope this patient. And if there's a mess, we still need to biopsy this mess. But um, EBV is good uh, in, the, in the sense that if I've got a neck uh, metastasis, I, the patient presents to me with a neck metastasis, but I scope the nose, I can't find a tumor in the nose. I scope the oral cavity, I cannot find a tumor in, uh, in, in the oral cavity. There's no other ENT primary tumors I can find. Then um, I would do an EBA, uh, which is an immunohistological staining um, of the uh, fine needle aspiration of the neck and, and test it for, for EBV. If it's positive, then we will assume that this is a primary nasopharyngeal carcinoma which has metastasized to the neck. And then I, I will call Dr. Kaira and tell her, look, you know, I, I think I've got an NPC, um, uh, but, you know, uh, but, we, but we can't find a primary tumor, but we, we will treat this neck metastasis as an NPC with a neck metastasis because the EBA uh, or the EBV is positive in the neck. Got it, doctor. Um, the second uh, is um, the, the question uh, which is coming on is, um, let's say we do get a, get a high-risk individual with a, uh, meaning someone in their family has NPC and, you know, we've spoken to them to get screening. Uh, and how do we kind of, uh, do we just refer them to an ENT to get a, to get a look at? Uh, this individual, and then subsequently, do do we keep on referring them every year to get a look at? Thank you. That's that's a very good question. So, um, 
in general, um, uh, what the Malaysian guidelines uh, suggest is that um, if someone's got a positive family history of NPC, um, ideally, uh, you should refer them to an ENT uh, to, to be scoped uh, so that we can have a look at the nasopharynx. Um, you know, there might not be anything over there. If there's, if there's, I'll, I'll go clinically. If there's no mess over there, uh, if there's no, uh, uh, no other clinical signs, um, then you know, I'll just tell the patient, come back in one year's time or come back to me uh, if you develop any neck swelling or any persistent ear discharge, ear symptoms, or any persistent uh, ear blockage. You can come back to me. I'll, and and uh, I would advise these patients to come back um, every year, at least so that we can perform a nasal endoscopy in them just to make sure that uh, there's no uh, tumors or if there's any tumors arising from the nasopharyngeal area, we can catch them early and buy it to them early and we'll start treatment early. Right, got it, Doc. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. I think at, at this point in time, those are the only questions that seem to be appearing uh, okay. for me to look at. Maybe um, some of our colleagues will have some right at the end. Uh, I think next, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if there are no more questions from, from this session, oh, there you go. Uh, uh, there's one more, Doc. Let's just take one more. Uh, the population above 52 who had NPC, what is the most common risk factor one of our colleagues asked? That's a good question. Thank you very much. Um, Again, the most common risk factor of NPC uh, in Malaysia is, uh, you know, uh, genetic and also which comes down to ethnicity, um, which means that, uh, again, in the Chinese race, which is the Chinese population, uh, are, 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 are at our highest risk of NPC uh, in uh, Peninsula Malaysia. This will be followed by the uh, Malay uh, ethnicity, and this will then be followed by the uh, Indian uh, ethnicity. Um, I've seen very few uh, Indian patients getting NPC, but it's most common among the uh, Chinese population. And of course, uh, smoking, um, uh, environmental factors that we discussed earlier on, uh, such as smoking, may also predispose to NPC. Now, we're going to understand, um, like every other tumor, um, the cause of tumorigenesis uh, is usually uh, not a single factor, it's usually multifactorial. You know, if, if you've got a genetic preponderance uh, you know, with smoking, with an environmental factors, uh, you add on multiple factors, then the, the risk of getting NPC increases. Okay, got it, got it, doctor. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so I think uh, what we shall do is, doc, shall we let uh, Dr. Karia come on? And okay. uh, subsequently, uh, let's take maybe questions jointly again right at the end. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to turn the session over to Dr. Kyria to continue with uh, management of uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Uh, Dr. Kyria, the screen is yours, Doctor. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Murali. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning or afternoon already. <laughs> okay, let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, doctor, and we can hear you clearly as well. All right, okay, thank you so much, Dr. Murali, and thank you also to Dr. Hadib. He already gave an excellent, excellent talk uh, with regard to the etiology, uh, the, the workup, the investigation, the, the, uh, and diagnosis, and all that. It's, it makes my, my life easier. Um, thank you so much uh, to the participant, to the audience as well. Uh, I'm Dr. Kairia uh, Siddiq. I'm a clinical oncologist from the Department of Radiotherapy and Oncology from uh, Hospital Chancellor Tuan Um Basically, I just joined uh, HUKM early last year. Before this, I was um, serving uh, UITM. Right, uh, I'm not going to go in detail um, in this, uh, I think Dr. Hadid already did an excellent job uh, with regard to the etiology and all that. I think my topic would focusing more on the treatment of NPC. And I was I understand that most of our participants are GPs. So I, I'm not going uh, I'm not going to go into the technicality and all the um, trial and all that because I want to simplify it and not make you all confused. So basically, we know that NPC is a unique disease. It has unique geographical uh, distribution. It's an endemic prevalence in um, particularly in Southeast Asia, Hong Kong, Taiwan, including um, Malaysia as well, and, uh, and also in the Northern Africa and Middle East. 
And in endemic um, area, the most common histology for the NPC is the non kernetizing and undifferentiated. It is co uh, constitute about more than 95% compared to the non-endemic area. I'm not going to go in, in detail with, uh, about EBV. I think Dr. Uh, Hadi already mentioned about it. So we know that EBV associated with multiple human cancer, um, including the lymphoid and epithelial. The lymphoid is basically is a blood, lah, blood cancer. Epithelial is the, the common, uh, what we call it, a solid tumor. And there is a strong association uh, uh, between the NPC risk and the HLA locus uh, at chromosome NP that indicating a link between the presentation of EBV antigen to host immune cell and NPC risk. So basically, EBV is associated with worse outcome. So for instance, for stage one uh, NPC, the survival is more than, uh, five year survival is more than 91%. Whereas if you have stage one, it's high EBV more than 4,000. The, the, the outcome is almost equivalent to stage 3 NPC, so the, which is the survivals uh, going down to 73%. So basically, EBV is more uh, what we call it is prognosis rather than predictive factors. Okay, I'm not going to into detail about the investigation. I think Harry also already mentioned about this. Uh, basically, the biopsy is the gold standard for you to diagnose the disease. And of course, we should do the imaging. Uh, usually, we will do the CT scanning to identify, uh, you know, the, the disease at the primary and also local regional and the distant metastasis. We don't always do MRI because of lack of uh, resource because uh, as we know in public hospital uh, the long uh, the, the queue is long so we don't always do that unless we really want to ascertain uh, you know the extent of the disease uh, as we know the MRI has a better you know uh, delineation of the soft tissue compared to the CT scan. For PET scan also is also an, another modality uh, radiological modality that we can use but of course I didn't do that for every patient. And this all modality radiology uh, uh, modalities is, is, is helpful for us, for uh, oncologists to delineate the target, the target, the, the tumor, so that it will help for us to contour the target. A little bit of staging. So the staging also has evolved. So last time for the AGCC7, uh, uh, you know, um, the T2 is just uh, is the, the, the tumor involved the pyropharyngeal, but anything lateral to it is considered T4. But now things has evolved, things has changed. The pterygoid plates and or and uh, pterygoid middle and lateral pterygoid is still considered T2, and anything lateral to lateral pterygoid considered T4. Same thing like uh, the, the the neck nodes. If the neck nodes is more than six centimeter or any to uh, any nodes that presents uh, below the caudal border of the cricoid and cartilage is considered entry disease. So how do we manage uh, the NPC? So now is the gist of my, my talk today. So we, we know that NPC or any cancer for that matter is a, a complex disease. It's not uh, something, there's no blanket rule for every uh, NPC, for instance. So in our center, we will always work in team. We never work in silo. So we get everybody to be involved. Uh, for, an, for managing NPC, for instance, we will get the ENT to be involved, oncologists to be involved, radiologists, pathologists, etc. to basically, um, you know, come uh, for the, 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 the discussion, the diagnosis and plan management. So we always work in team. So the principle of management of primary NPC. So we know that... Um, NPC is one of few cancer that is very radio sensitive. So bear in mind, NPC is one of the cancer that we can treat just uh, by giving radiation therapy plus minus chemotherapy. Because for more solid tumor, we have to do the surgery together as a definitive treatment. But NPC is a bit different. Uh, of course, surgery is very challenging uh, for NPC because of the anatomical, uh, anatomically is challenging. But thank God it is very radiosensitive, so we can treat 
um, and we see this radiation. So radiation therapy is the mainstay for the first line local therapy. So for stage one, the outcome or the survival is excellent, even with RT alone. Stage one means it's a T1 and not. So we can, um, how to say, we can get away from giving uh, chemotherapy. So we can just give radiotherapy for stage one. However, for locally advanced tumor for the stage three and stage four, the survival is not as good as stage one. Stage one, you can get by the survival more than 90, 95%, for instance. But stage four and stage st uh, locally advanced stage three, stage four, the, 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 the uh, you know, the survival uh, last time was quite this small, so survival around 50%. But now things have changed for the past two decades. The survival has increased tremendously from 50% to more than 70%. This attributed by two major uh, factors. First is the incorporation of chemotherapy on top of radiation therapy. So we know that uh, from the multiple studies shows that when we incorporate chemotherapy for locally advanced, the outcome is better. And secondly, is the gradual switch of the radiation treatment from conventional to conformal radiation therapy. I will explain more about that later. Okay. So basically what we do in, in, in our clinic, in our center, so when we had uh, uh, the, the, the new case in, in clinics, particularly the ENT team, we see this patient, they will take the history and you know do the uh, necessary investigation, do the direct scope, examine the patients, uh, do the imaging and all that. And once the diagnosis is established, they will call us in our MDT's clinic so we will counsel, counsel the patients about the plan of management. So in this case for NBC, most of the time patients need radiation plus chemotherapy because as Dr. Hardy already mentioned, majority of our patients presented as locally advanced This is more than 70%. So most patients need uh, both chemo and radiation, particularly induction chemotherapy followed by chemo radiation. So before we initiate the treatment, we will do the necessary workout, yeah? particularly the blood investigation to see the organ functions. Uh, we need to send for dental clearance to remove uh, any tooth decay and all that, hearing assessment, Okay, some patients might have a pre-existing uh, hearing problem, whether it's conductive because of the disease or pre-existing sensory neural hearing problem, because we know that this uh, radiation treatment and chemotherapy can, you know, sometimes uh, causing hearing problem later on. So we need some baseline. And nutritional assessment is very important. We want to ensure that the patient is, uh, you know, uh, has a good nutrition status because that would um, help in terms of uh, the treatment and the recovery later on. So I'm going to talk about induction chemotherapy. Yeah? So we give induction chemotherapy, particularly for locally advanced tumor. So induction chemotherapy. So Actually, there are many uh, studies uh, looking at what is the best, uh, uh, you know, uh, treatment and sequence uh, for locally advanced tumors. So the earlier study shows that if we incorporate chemo, this radiation therapy means concurrent chemo radiation therapy versus radiation therapy alone, it shows um, survival benefit. And then after that, there are many studies looking at giving chemotherapy after, meaning that after the radiation therapy, uh, as what we call it adjuvant treatment, it shows uh, better survival, better outcome. And there is also studies looking at induction chemotherapy, meaning that we give chemotherapy before we initiate the uh, radiation uh, therapy. So for to this date, the best um, uh, modality, the best sequence uh, and choice for therapy for locally advanced tumor is induction chemotherapy, meaning that we give chemotherapy prior to concurrent chemo radiation therapy. So the reason being, okay, first, this modality has better survival benefit. Uh, second, 
it would facilitate for our radiation treatment, meaning that when we give chemotherapy, it, we can downstage the tumor, we shrink down the tumor. So the dose, the high dose that when we draw later during the treatment planning, it will be reduced. So when it's reduced, so we reduce the uh, radiation dose to the surrounding uh, organ at risk. Yeah? And thirdly, most patients uh, has likelihood to complete the treatment. Unlike if we give chemotherapy after radiation therapy, some patients did not complete the treatment because patients are already very tired because radiation therapy is quite tough. It's a tough therapy. So I'm not going into detail about this. This is just uh, showing the induction, the, the benefit of induction chemotherapy uh, plus concurrent chemotherapy versus uh, concurrent chemotherapy alone. So this study is uh, using the TPF regime, the texin-based chemotherapy. Of course, it, this study is done in this Asian study. So they give the uh, reduced dose rather than the typical dose of TPF. And it shows a benefit in terms of uh, failure-free survival and overall survival during the first three and after five years after the treatment. So what are the regime of choice? So last time we used to give fluorouracil cisplatin dose. So when I was in training last time, um, we used via FU, fluorouracil based chemotherapy and cisplatin. But there are more and more um, uh, you know, uh, studies looking at what are other uh, modalities or regime of choice that we can offer to uh, NPC. Some give capsetabine cisplatin, which is uh, is not something common. Some give doxetaxel cisplatin. And TPF just now, I just mentioned, is just too toxic for Asian patients. Uh, I personally never give um, TPF to any of my head and neck cancer because it's just too toxic. A lot of patients cannot, cannot stand the side effect. And now we give gemcetabine and cisplatin. So a little bit of history about gemcetabine and cisplatin. So basically, when I was training, as I remember, we give gemcetabine cisplatin as a palliative research, a drug of choice for palliative. So we noticed that gemcetabine cisplatin has a better response compared to fluorouracil or other regimes. And this has con it, this actually is confirmed from Chinese studies. Uh, this is just showing you the, 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 the phase three trial uh, at, at a set, uh, palliative setting. Yeah, palliative setting for uh, NPC, gemcitabine uh, plus cisplatin versus fluorouracil plus uh, cisplatin. So in gemcitabine cisplatin, it shows better response. You know, you can see here 8% has complete response. Um, 55% has partial response, it, it has better response compared to fluorouracil. And it is more tolerable. It is very much more tolerable compared to fluorouracil plus cisplatin. I personally, uh, for, for my patient, a lot of them has a very good response with gem cytobine cisplatin. I had one patient presented with 10 centimeter neck node. After two cycles, it's flattened. So it's a very good patient. This is what we call it a game changer in mesopharyngeal asthma. And of course, after that, we incorporate the gemcitabine cisplatin in uh, locally advanced um, uh, cancer phase three trial. It shows better response. So that's how we uh, basically uh, giving the gemcitabine cisplatin chemotherapy as induction chemotherapy. So uh, I just want to add on a lot of patients. Some patients, when we counsel for chemotherapy, they are very, very concerned, they are very scared because they hear a lot of horror story from their families or their friends saying that, oh, you, you are going to vomit, you're going to losing hair, you're going to uh, have very bad uh, reaction, things like that. But I always reassure them, tell them that, look, chemotherapy, particularly the gem cytobin system, is a very tolerable, it's very manageable. But the radiotherapy part is the one is tougher. Radiotherapy is tougher for NPC patients compared to chemotherapy. So it's very important to counsel the patients and make it clear to them that uh, they have to undergo this treatment to achieve a best response. So after we give induction chemotherapy, so basically we give chemotherapy up to three cycles. 
Okay. Um, and then we do the CT simulation after completion of chemo. We do the CT simulation. So CT simulation is a basically is a CT scan that we um, get the image of the of the of the patient of the of the, the, the target, um, and then we will make a special mask on for the patient. It's custom made for patient. So basically, the mask is uh, basically to, to make sure that the patient won't move. Yeah, so the head shouldn't move because we want to make sure that the radiation treatment is uh, you know precise to the target. Okay, so after CT simulation, after we acquire the images and all that, we will do the radiotherapy planning. Okay, so this is the tedious part, the radiotherapy planning. So I'm going to switch to radiotherapy. So what is radiotherapy? Uh, actually, I'm surprised a lot of people they don't have. Uh, they do. They are not clear what is a uh, radiotherapy. Uh, of course, when I ask patients, some of them they have no clue at all what is uh, radiotherapy. Some patients say describe it as a laser. Some patients say it's a current. So no, it's not. Uh, radiation is something like X-ray. It is an X-ray. Yeah. So if you guys never had the chance to see how is it look like. This is how it look like. Okay. So there is a couch. For patient to lie down and the radiographer will position the patient properly. And this is the machine. This is the Lynette machine. This is the gantry head. Yeah? So how does it produce? So basically, a little bit of physics here. So basically, there is an accelerator. Yeah? So the, from the source, it will produce electron. The accelerator basically make it uh, faster, uh, so to speak. And then there's a bending magnet here. Yeah? And then it will hit the target. Um, and then from there, it will produce photon. Okay, so from that energy, uh, only 1% produce as photon. Another 99% is produced as heat. Yeah? So this is the, uh, what it, uh, the jaw, what we, uh, we call it jaw, and this is the multi-leaf collimator. Multi-leaf collimator is basically, it's a, it's a leaf, basically it looks like a, um, you know, it's a leaf basically to conform the target. Yeah. So this is how it's. Really, I'm sorry, I don't have a video today. So basically, the 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 gantry head will move around the patient, and it will shoot the radiation to the target to the patient. Yeah. So in our center, we have IMRT. Yeah, IMRT basically in in, in our center, the way they, they they do it is basically step and shoot, meaning that. It will move around the patient, step and shoot, step and shoot, step and shoot. Okay. Right. So basically, radiation therapy has evolved uh, over for the past two decades. So uh, last time, those days, uh, we used 2D uh, technique whereby we get the orthogonal film and draw from the film and give radiation from there. And after that, we uh, move to 3D. We still have 3D in our center. Okay, and uh, then later on uh, during 20s, we uh, already had this, what we call it, uh, IMRT technique, yeah, uh, intensity model RT, uh, whereby it make the radiation therapy more conformal, more conformal means more targeted, meaning we deposit the, the radiation uh, dose uh, higher to the target rather than uh, the organ at the surrounding it. So the more sophisticated the, the, the radiation technique is, uh, the better the anatomic conformity to the target. Yeah. Right, so what we do, so during planning, okay, planning is quite a tedious work. So uh, once we, we, we get the images, we will delineate the target. So we use all the modality we have, for instance, like let's say the patient had the MRI before, so we will fuse the images with the CT simulation images. So it will help us to delineate the target. So we will draw nicely the target. Yeah. So in radiation therapy, there is a concept of what we call it GTV, gross tumor volume. CTV, clinical target volume, yeah. So GTV is whatever tumor that you can see, the gross tumor that you can see. So you draw that, give a little bit of margin, and that area should receive the highest dose. So in NPC, usually we give up to 70 grade, yeah. So that is for the high risk area, meaning that we cannot 
visualize the tumor, but we know that this area is at a higher risk. We call it CTV. So we draw that also. Yeah, if the tumor just confined to nasoparin, for instance, we just need to cover half of the sphenoid that would be surface. Yeah. And also not to forget the neck node. So delineation of neck node is very much depends on the uh, presentation, how big the neck node, how many neck node has uh, involved. And that now there's a concept of the escalation of radiation therapy. I'm not going to cover that. That's beyond the scope for today. So in general, let's say there's a widespread neck node. I usually cover from 1B to level 5. You know? So this is one example of radiation therapy planning uh, for one of my patients. Uh, if you can see here, this is what we call it a uh, dose color wash. Yeah, dose color wash for 60 gray. Yeah, this is for CTV, uh, high risk area. Yeah, 95%, meaning that you can see this is IMRT technique. Yeah, so you can see nice, you can see that the dose distribution nicely here to the target. This is the, the GTV. Yeah, it's it's curved nicely around the brain stem. So we want to minimize dose to the uh, brain stem or any other organ at least, especially in NPC, the brain stem, the optic apparatus, and the cord. Okay, this is how it looks like. Just to give you, uh, if you can imagine, yeah, for IMRT, they have multiple beam entries. For instance, in this case, in this case, we have nine beam entry. So more beam entry and with different um Collimeter meaning is is more conformal. It's more uh, how to say it? more conformal. It means more targeted to the to the target. Minimize uh, those to the surrounding area. Okay, not to make you all confused, uh, but just to show you guys after we control the target and do the planning and all that. We will analyze. There is a, what we call it statistic statistical analysis of of the radiation treatment. Okay, so this is what we call it dose volume histogram. Just to show you, you know, this is the dose, this is the volume. So um, maybe I can just summarize like this. Um, we want to put the target, um, uh, the target uh, to the right, and we want to bring the organ at risk to the left. Yeah. So we want to make sure that we are minimizing the organ at risk, but we want to maximizing radiation to the Target organ, and of course, every target organ has different um, level of uh, tolerance. Yeah, so we have to respect all the, the the tolerance of each organ. Okay, so what happened after we we do the planning, um, and the planning has approved, and the physicists will do the Q and A and all that. Uh, we will call the patient to start the treatment. So for NPC, usually we give um, a concurrent uh, chemo and radiation. Yeah? So basically what we do is we give radiation daily from Monday to Friday. Yeah? So for 70 grays, meaning that we have to give for 35 fraction. So 35 fraction Monday to uh, Friday, it takes about seven weeks. Yeah? So basically we don't, we don't treat over the weekend or public holiday. Lah. Yeah. And we give concurrent with IV cisplatin, intravenous cisplatin. This is the chemotherapy. Okay, why we give chemotherapy? Okay, of course, there's survival benefit. And how does it work? Basically, the chemotherapy acts as a radio sensitizer. It enhances the effect of the radiation. Yeah? So we give weekly, once in a week. Okay, but of course, we have to um, monitor accordingly. Uh, look at the blood count. If the blood count is okay, we can proceed. Yeah, if the blood count is low, neutropenic, then of course, we cannot proceed. Lah. Yeah. And there are a lot of other things that we need to uh, review. Yeah, for, for mostly, usually in our center, in our other center as well, we, we will uh, do weekly review. Weekly review meaning that the doctor will see the patient every weekly to see the clinical response, how much the tumor has shrunk. Yeah. Weight monitoring, very important because we want to make sure that the patient did not. Um, losing weight so much okay so what happened if patient has uh, extreme uh, weight loss it will make the mask the bds we call it loose yeah so when it's loose the patient can move so the 
the, the treatment may not be precise anymore. So we have to replan. Yeah? So we want to avoid that because it's very labor intensive. Okay. And of course, we need to monitor the toxicities as well. Yeah? And of course, verification, we want to ensure that whatever treatment that we deliver to the patient is, is accurate. Yeah? Uh, upon treatment completion, we will monitor the patient, we will see the patient and we do the follow-up. Usually we do uh, six weeks uh, post-completion of treatment just to, to have a look, yeah? to have a look at the patients. Okay, what are the side effects? So side effect for radiation therapy, uh, uh, especially we can divide it to two, acute toxicity and late toxicity. So acute to toxicity usually happen during treatment. But usually, it didn't happen um, immediately after we initiate the treatment. Usually, it happened during or after the third week of starting the radiation therapy. And the more, the more radiation therapy that we give, the higher the toxicity is. Yeah? So these are the common, I'm not going to spell it out all, so you can have a look and you can read up here. So the most common, uh, uh, acute toxicity for um, radiation therapy to head and neck is soreness, dry mouth, yeah, oral mucositis, and all that. And this is something very important for us to to pay it. I mean, to 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 help patient and treat the symptom. We will give a gargle, from gargle, for instance, uh, vicious um, uh, vicious gel, uh, lignocaine gel for the patient to ease the pain. Um, during the swallowing and all that and a bit of morphine sometimes. So we want to ensure that the patient, uh, the, the pain and the, 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 the side effect is manageable because otherwise patient may not be motivated to continue the treatment. And it is very, very important to ensure that the patient completed the treatment in timely manner, meaning that we already said we want to give patients 73, 35 patients in seven weeks. So we should complete the treatment in seven weeks. Okay. It is so very important because okay, what happens if if we delay the treatment a couple of weeks or one week, two weeks? What will happen is the tumor will repopulate. Repopulate meaning the tumor can regrow even faster. So we want to avoid we want to avoid this problem. So we have to complete the treatment as much, uh, I mean, in, in time limit as much as possible. Yeah. So what are the late toxicity? The late toxicity happen after completion of the treatment. Sometimes patients can have permanent loss of saliva. Even though this um, side effect can be reduced um, uh, in more conformal technique, uh, for instance, the IMRT, but still, you know, I think a little bit, uh, about 25% still have permanent serotomia or uh, what we call it, uh, loss of saliva. Osteoradionocracy is also possible. It's very, very rare happen now because now since, since IMRT era, dentist caries also can happen, fibrosis, impaired wood healing and all that, lymph edema, yeah. Uh, another thing is after radiation therapy, some patients might have a little bit of swelling in the face, particularly in the submental. So a lot of people mistaken it as a recurrence. Yeah? So it's not always <laughs> the case. Yeah? So what happens is when we give radiation therapy to the survival change, it will disrupt the, uh, what we call it, the, the cervical, the, the, uh, the lymph nodes. Yeah? So it, the patient might have a little bit of swelling. So what we'll do is we will have a look, examine the patient, do a scan and all that to make sure that it is not recurrent. Yeah? Uh, hypothyroidism also can happen to about, uh, I'm, I, I can remember on top of my head, maybe about 50% of the patient, but it's not happened uh, immediately after the treatment, maybe a couple of years after completion of the treatment. So this is how it looks like. Yeah? So the skin become reddish. Yeah? Erythema, we call it. And... After completion of treatment, usually it will recover, and right? skin will recover. But sometimes, um, patient might notice there will be a hyperpigmentation or hypopigmentation. Usually, hyperpigmentation are meaning that the skin is a little bit uh, darker compared to the non irradiated area. Yeah? But rest assured that it is not something that you, you should worry about. Yeah? But it is permanent. Lah, yeah? So, this is uh, mucosity, this is how it looks like. So, we need to support the patient. Uh, by giving all the medication that I already mentioned just now. 
So care during radiotherapy. Um, so usually what we'll what what will what we will um, <laughs> um advise patient is avoid all the spicy or raw food. Okay. So during radiation therapy, the mucosa and all that become very sensitive. Okay, so we want to reduce the, the, the irritant, yeah, like spicy food or rough food, particularly. So it will not irritate the mucosa further. And of course, uh, we also advise patients not to eat or drink uh, food that is very hot or icy cold. Yeah, um, that also can precipitate the, the, the symptom. Uh, and very, very important do not smoke never ever smoke is it, because it will make the side effect even worse yeah uh, stay away from sugary snack good mouthwash uh, mouth uh, mouth hygiene very important and all that lah, huh? so i will touch a little bit of the current esophageal carcinoma so basically um uh, uh recurrent esophageal carcinoma could happen though it's not very common, but it still can happen about 80% of the cases. Yeah? So um, it can present it, it can recur at the primary instead or local regional or even you know uh, distant metastasis. So in treating um, recurrence uh, NPC, uh, it is a bit challenging because it very much depends on the presentation itself. Yeah, so we will assess the patient. So this is when MDT is, is, is so very important. So we will assess the patient, do the clinical evaluation, see patient's uh, condition, the fitness and all that. Let's say the patient is in bad shape, patient uh, eco performer is very poor, widespread metastasis on all that, uh, very, very ill uh, to, to go through treatment. And of course, that, that kind of patient we, we subject for supportive care. But those who are well, majority they are quite well actually, uh, we will uh, basically see uh, what is the, the presentation, where is the recurrence, huh? uh, whether surgery is amenable or not, uh, whether we can re-irradiate or not. Yeah? So the management is tailored according to patient's uh, condition, patient's presentations. Yeah? So what are non-surgical modalities for recurrent NPC? So there are few modalities that we can uh, offer to patient. Uh, but for most patients, for non-surgical modality, for most patients, we will offer re-irradiation. Yeah? So for recurrence, we don't give 3D or conventional radiation therapy. If the patient were to you know, re-irradiate, we will use IMRT technique. And of course, we cannot give a high dose as the primary, usually we give up to 60 gray only. And if let's say the patient has small lesion, we can offer stereotactic radiotherapy. Yeah, if the tumor is less than three centimeter. And if the center has access to proton therapy, we can you know offer proton therapy. Of course, we don't have proton therapy here in our region. Brachytherapy, okay. I don't have uh, experience giving brachytherapy, but last time we used to give brachytherapy. Uh, for some uh, recurrence uh, NPC. Uh, chemotherapy usually we reserve for those who has uh, uh, metastatic disease, widespread metastatic disease. If patient has very limited small lesion, for example, for instance, limited, uh, lung, limited to the lung, small lesion, some patient we might offer reception for fit patient. Some patient we can offer um, targeted therapy, something like uh, RFA. Yeah? So these are other modalities that we can offer to, to the patient. So it doesn't mean that if patient has metastatic disease, yeah, small metastatic lesion, we just, okay, we just give him kimono. So we have to see and tailor according to patient's presentation and symptom. So a little bit of IMPT, um, what we call it, proton therapy. So some of you might wonder what is the difference between IMRT photon therapy and proton therapy. So proton therapy is a heavy charge, uh, is a charge a particle a radiation therapy. So the nature of a proton therapy is it has what we call it break peak. Break peak meaning that it can the the position of the dose to the target is 
is at greatest, meaning that we can uh, deposit the, the, the radiation to the target, the highest uh, dose to the target, but we are sparing the organ at risk. Yeah, for instance, like in this case, uh, to the to the brain stem. Yeah, of course, for IMRT, we can we can reduce the dose to the brain stem, but if you can see here, there is a lot of low dose paths to the surrounding. But for proton, you can minimize it as so much. Yeah, compared to IMRT. Yeah. But of course, we don't have um, proton therapy uh, in our country or even our region. I think the nearest is in Taiwan. And proton therapy um, uh, is very, very expensive. Yeah? So what are the take-home messages? So I think I've already come to, 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 to the end already. So we know that NPC is one of the most common uh, uh, is a false commoners uh, cancer in Malaysia. So it's very important for you guys to know what are the common symptoms and what are the target patients. Yeah? And radiation treatment plus minus uh, chemotherapy is the treatment for the primary NPC. And so we know that NPC is very chemo and radiation sensitive. And treatment for recurrent NPC is personalized and tailored according to the patient, as I already mentioned. Early intervention is the key to achieve higher chance of cure. And best to treat yeah, NPC is best to treat at high volume center at the tertiary center. Okay, so I think I'm ready. Uh, okay, I've already come to the end. Thank you so much for your attention. Back to you, Dr. Murali. Thank you so much, Doctor. I think uh, what was lovely uh, about this is I think, uh, again, like Dr. Hadib, I think you managed to give us a very comprehensive uh, look, uh, Doctor, at uh, management of NPC. Um, I'm, I'm looking to see if there's uh, some uh, additional questions. There's one question I think that is uh, for Dr. Hadib, but before that, like, could I just put, there's one or two questions for Dr. Karia as well. Doctor, there's one question from a colleague who asks, um, is there any role for targeted or uh, immunotherapy within the management of NPCs? Well, I know that this question is coming. <laughs> a lot of people are so <laughs> excited about immunotherapy and all that because it sounds it sounds sexy, right? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, of course, immunotherapy is one of the emerging um, uh, uh, cancer treatment. It's an established in certain tumors such as uh, lung cancer, melanoma, and even non-NPC uh, squamous cell, head and neck cancer. Uh, but for an NPC, there are a few emerging, um, uh, what we call it, um, uh, you know, studies, a uh, trial looking at it. Uh, there are two studies, if I'm not mistaken, for phase three trial that did not fail to um, achieve the, the, what we call it, the, the outcome. But there are uh, positive study as well. So until we get more data to support using immunotherapy in NPC, as to date, we, we only offer chemo radiation for locally advanced um, uh, NPC. Because um, having said that, there are a few unanswered questions as well for uh, incorporating uh, immunotherapy in NPC. Because every treatment comes with uh, side effect or toxicity. <laughs> yeah? So the more treatment we give to patient, we will expect the more toxicity to patient. So we're not sure what are the, 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 the short-term and the long-term side effect if we incorporate chemo, uh, uh, um, immunotherapy plus chemo radiation, number one. And another unanswered question is, what is the optimal sequence? Yeah, so should we give uh, before, should we give during or after chemo radiation? And the cost effectiveness. As uh, Dr. Burari already said, in our population, unfortunately, a lot of patients struggling to pay for even for basic um, necessity and basic treatment. Some of patients even, you know, struggling to pay for taxi fare. So, you know, so it, it, it's not that, um, how to say, simple lah, yeah, uh, to, to basically to incorporate that in, in our 
treatments. So we need we may do what we can do. So as for now, most of patients has good response with chemo radiation or locally advanced tumor. Right, right. And I think that's that's the really important point that you're putting forward to us, doctor. The fact that actually with radio and chemo, these patients are already getting a significant amount of uh, uh, how to say. Uh, reduction, uh, uh, movement of symptoms, and uh, movement of uh, disease, uh, and and so the the question I think because um, we also keep keep on getting this. Um, there's this very big misconception that um, chemo and radio is two things that are very very uh, bad for patients in terms of side effects, and everything is rosy when you have immunotherapy or targeted therapy. Yeah. Immunotherapy is not without side effects. Sometimes it's, it's, it's even worse. Absolutely. Yeah. Chemo radiation is not outdated. Yep, yep. I, I think, uh, really, Dr. What, what uh, I hope that to our colleagues today, uh, Dr. Kairi Apnew, your message is, is kind of very clear. Um, in, in NPC, the evidence is uh, not uh, yet within that space. And more importantly, evidence of chemo radio is still extremely uh, in, uh, how to say, not in the really in vogue, but is, is where the standard of practice and standard of care is. Um, so, um, uh, Dr. Harib, there's one question to you, Doc, on X-ray of post-nasal space. Uh, is a AP and a lateral view uh, able to visualize NPCs? Okay, that's, that's a good question. Um, a radiographs of the uh, nasal cavity or post-nasal space um, is a thing of the past. Um, if you can visualize it uh, with an endoscopy, you can get real-time image, you can really see what the nasopharynx look like. Um, that's the best, of course. Um, and uh, even, even for sinusitis, chronic rhinosinusitis, sinusitis, um, with the advent of uh, and availability of CT of the paranasal sinuses, we do not perform uh, radiographs because radiographs give us very little information, mainly highlights the bone. And uh, we've got to understand that NPC is a soft tissue disease. Um, and uh, an AP would not be able to adequately expose the nasopharynx because it lies pretty much at the back posteriorly. And even laterally, um, all you can see uh, is, you know, a foreign body or which is, uh, no, or, or, or the vertebra. Uh, you, you can't even say whether it's on the left side or the right side. Um, I, I know for, for, for kids, um, you know, a lateral neck x-ray, you know, you can, can show a thumb sign, which is epigotitis, etc. But for NPC, uh, its role is very, very, very limited. Okay. Uh, got it, doctor. Uh, and endoscopy you. is still gold standard. Still yeah. the, the best way to visualize this. Uh, yeah. Dr. Kairia, there's a question for doctor. Uh, this is quite an interesting question. Um, I think, and, and this is a, a, a practitioner who asks us on whether uh, they have a patient who's gone for a CT scan and actually has visualized like a mass in the nasopharyngeal cavity. Now, um, this the, the physician asks, um, should they then kind of uh, look directly to refer to oncology or does it still take the route to, to go to the ENT and then uh, come back? Sure, I'll say it's ENT. Because ENT, ENT can directly visualize using the mm -hmm. endoscope mm -hmm. and we still need the confirmation, histology confirmation from the Absolutely. biopsy. Absolutely. Okay, got it, doctor. Oh, another question for you, doctor. In the sense of um, in, in visualizing the NPC, uh, and I think subsequent imaging, um, better for PET scan as an initial and for recurrence uh, or uh, MRI. Oh, it's question to me, is it? Ah, uh, yes, doctor. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, basically, the MRI and uh, the, uh, the the PET scan basically complement each other. So MRI will give the the, the information regarding the soft tissue, um, uh, and that it is it, it, it's good if we can have the previous imaging so that we can compare this. If we don't have and we are not quite sure whether this is truly recurrent or it is just residual, we might um, uh, do the PET scan to ascertain whether this is an active tumor or not. But bear in mind, um, PET scan is uh, highly sensitive but not specific. And some small lesion, for instance, if patient has small neck nodes, less than 0.5 centimeter, it may not light up. 
Okay, so it doesn't mean that we just doing the PET scan, you can get the answer. So it is more complex than that. Right, got, got it, doctor. Could, um, could, I, could doc I add on to that, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Morales? Yes, please yeah, do, doctor. I, I completely agree uh, to, do, to what Dr. Karen said. Um, but I think the role of PET over here is only for um, um, we're suspecting metastatic disease or we're suspecting recurrence where we're not too sure if this is a real recurrence or is it a scar tissue from previous treatment. You know, we, we, uh, and biopsy, you know, it's also, you know, uh, indeterminate in, in such cases. And then we can do all the, all the lesions very deep in um, the, the, the nasopharyngeal or the parapharyngeal space where we can't reach it without undergoing a big surgery. Then, then a PET scan may help us to 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 point us towards the right, right direction, whether it is uh, you know a real recurrence or is it a scar tissue or is it just an infective uh, lesion? And I agree with Dr. Karel in, in terms for us. Um, if there's a primary recurrence or primary residual, that means primary residual recurrence means that recurrence occurs in the nasal pharynx in the nose. Mm -hmm. um, I would prefer an MRI because um, I may be considering a nasal pharyngectomy for this patient. And as Dr. Karel has um, correctly uh, pointed out. Uh, MRI gives us uh, very good soft tissue delineation. Um, so I would know how, how deep um, of a nasopharyngectomy uh, can I perform, how extensive of a nasopharyngectomy I can perform uh, in, in this patient. If it's just a neck recurrence, that means uh, metastasis around the neck, quite often um, a CT scan uh, is sufficient, um, whereby I can see to what extent the lymph nodes uh, in the neck have gone to, have they gone into the carotid arteries, um, you know, have they gone uh, and attached to muscles? Yeah. Got it. Got it, doctor. Doctor, just while I have you as well, there's an, I think, a continuation of that earlier question on whether plain X-ray of the post-nasal space, uh, anterior posterior lateral, together with bleeding on eustachian catheterization, can that be something which is useful to kind of point us towards NPC? Uh, not really. Uh, the, the role of um, x-rays are very, very limited. NPC is a soft tissue disease. Um, radiographs only give us um, uh, good, information, good information on, um, on, on bony structures. Um, no, uh, again, endoscopy is still gold standard because we can visualize the nasopharynx. If there's a lesion there, we can biopsy it. Similarly, examination with the neck is still gold standard. Uh, you know, if there's a lip node, we can perform a fine needle aspiration also cytology. Um, of the neck. Um, if you suspect, if your primary care physician or if you're a physician, if you suspect your patients to have NPC, non-resolving ear disease, non-resolving no symptoms, um, refer them to ENT, we can work them up, diagnose them, and then um, uh, we can then, um, you know, have a discussion with the oncologist on the next step of treatment, you know, whether it's, you know, CCRT, etc. Okay. Got it. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Dr. Kairia, um, there's a question on um, how, okay, when patients complete the primary, I suppose, um, cycle of, of uh, management, meaning that when they post, uh, they go into some kind of uh, uh, control disease, um, is there, the, the question is, one, uh, is there a follow-up with both the teams, oncology and ENT? And the second question is, when they do come to a primary physician, um, what are the signs that we should be worried about? Because they will, they will come often for URTI line, and this kind of general things. What are the kind of, are there any things that should be suspicious enough for a primary care physician to look like, let, let's scale this up? For second question, for managing of ear symptom, I think but again, Dr. Hardip is the best person to answer that. For the first question, yes, both of us, the oncologist and the ENT surgeon, we do follow up this patient. We never left the patient alone. We will do, um, uh, you know, uh, like two monthly follow up initially, and after that, we make a bigger gap, like three months mm -hmm. later after that too. So from our side, basically, we want to uh, monitor the clinical symptom, the side effect particularly. But let's say, you know, for, for the suspicions of the, the recurrence, the ENT is actually the best person to elicit because they can do the direct nurses group to see whether there is a recurrence in the primary or not. Yeah. Um, so second question, I think Dr. Hadi is the best person to ask. <laughs> Um, thank you. I think I think it's a really good question. Uh, post uh, patients, you know, um, been treated for NPC on, on follow ups. So we do follow them uh, up closely up to five years, um, and um, I, I we do see them uh, in in, uh, in the clinic. Uh, if you follow the guidelines in Malaysia, the Malaysian guidelines states that 
And the patients with NPC um, in the first year of the follow-up is supposed to be uh, two to three monthly. Uh, in the second year, it's uh, three to four monthly, et cetera. So um, whenever the patients come for follow-up, um, um, I always check the ears because um, even post-radiation, they might have uh, ear disease, they might have some hearing loss. So I work really closely with my audiologist. Uh, some of them may require hearing aids um, and, uh, and some of them have persistent ear discharge. In these patients, uh, we may consider uh, treating the ear discharge and, um, and also not to forget some um, after radiation, some of them may have uh, a decrease in uh, production of saliva. So I know, um, you know, management of um, uh, swallowing is also important uh, in these patients. Um, having said that, um, as Dr. Kara has uh, spoken to us, the side effects of uh, newer treatments such as IMRT uh, are less compared to old conventional uh, radiotherapy. Uh, gone were the days that we used to see, um, you know, uh, severe osteomyelitis or the skull base. You know, initial treatments, uh, you know, uh, you know, first two, two dimensional radiotherapy those days used to give us a lot of um, osteoradionecrosis after 20 or 30 years, but nowadays uh, these incidences are reducing in trend. And of course, yes. upon follow-up, uh, we always put a scope uh, into the nose. Um, we take the weight of the patient to see whether the, uh, the nutrition is okay. Uh, and also we, also, we always palpate the neck. If there's suspicions, again, we will go down to the route of taking a biopsy, performing an FNAC, or performing a re-imaging of the patient. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I'm, I'm just conscious of time as well. And I'd really like to, again, um, thank both of y'all um, uh, for this wonderful session. Uh, seeing as there are not any more questions at this point in time, every time I say that, and then somebody will just type a question. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm just going to invite uh, both of y'all to maybe uh, give us uh, some uh, final take home um, messages. Uh, as we go home to digest on our lemang and rendang and and uh, getting ready for raya. Okay, so uh, maybe Dr. Dr. Karia, uh, Dr. want to go first? Well, uh, as uh, I mentioned just now, uh, NPC is one of the commonest um, uh, cancer solid tumor in Malaysia, and it is very, very uh, chemo and radio sensitive. So it's very important for patients to basically come forward and get the diagnosed earlier so it's for, to maximize the survival benefit and of course very important for the healthcare professional the GPs as well to know what are the common symptoms of presentation of the NPCs and what is the necessary things to do after that that's all right will do thank you thank you so much doctor dr hadim um, yep, the message um, which I would like to uh, stress upon is um, NPC is very common, especially among the uh, Chinese ethnicity uh, in Malaysia. Early diagnosis is very important. So high index of suspicions if the patient comes with non-resolving nasal symptoms, uh, non-resolving ear symptoms, neck metastasis, and uh, neck lesions, um, do refer them early uh, to the ENT so that we can diagnose them early and also initiate treatment. As we all know, um, uh, in Malaysia, there's, there's a delay in diagnosis, which leads, which leads to um, higher stage disease. So if we can treat them early, diagnose them early, and treat them early, uh, outcomes are often better. Right. Well do. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Hadip and uh, Dr. Kairia, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this this uh, morning, we spoke about, you know, coming into the afternoon now, uh, we spoke about nasopharyngeal carcinoma and joining us today was Dr. Hadip Singende, consultant um, ENT uh, surgeon, head and neck surgeon with Hospital um, uh, Chancellor Tuanko Muris, and also consultant oncologist Dr. Kairia Side with Hospital Chancellor Tuanko Muris. So I hope you've had a very insightful session with a lot of kind of very good and uh, updated um, points from, from both the speakers. And with that, uh, as, as we know at the conclusion of these sessions, please feel free to kind of get your points, uh, CPD points. And uh, thank you very much. Wishing everyone a wonderful long holiday and uh, Salam ID for three. For those who are celebrating, for those who are just uh, traveling, please uh, stay safe. And of course, uh, uh, despite all the relaxing of the measures, there's still a lot of COVID, so just be a little more careful to not have that spike. Thank you very much and have a wonderful um, week, weekend and, and long week of holidays ahead. Take care. Thank you very much, doctors. We'll see you.